In our last video, we resolved a gang conflict at the Angel's Boneyard. While there, we talked with a tarot card reader who gave us the location of the Mariposa military base. We also learned from a former Vault 13 dweller who was sent out into the wasteland to recover a water chip just like we were, that the children of the cathedral are secretly working with the master, helping him to build his super mutant army. And so with the children of the cathedral disguise in hand, just in case we need it, we head to the far northeasternmost corner of the map. We stumble upon many battles along the way, and the further northeast we travel, the more super mutants we find. And with them are what the game calls strange creatures. These are hideous centaur. They were likely made from humans like the super mutants were, but they no longer resemble man. The centaur are likely an extreme example of what happens when the master injects an irradiated wastelander with damaged DNA with the FEV. The centaur appear to have more limbs than a human does. That and the fact that one of this two-headed creature's heads is a dog leads us to conclude that the master is throwing animals into the same pot as his FEV rejects, just to kind of see what happens. Another creature we find here is a floater. These are fast, but they're much less dangerous than a centaur. These have a worm-like appearance and are presumably descended from the flatworms that we learned Westech experimented on when we read the holotapes from the glow. The flatworms could reproduce asexually, which may explain why we find so many of them as members of the Master's army. At long last, and after traveling 13 squares due west of Vault 13, we find the Mariposa military base. As soon as we arrive, Ian says, this is gonna be a tough nut to crack. We see super mutants guarding a fenced off area. To the east, we see the entrance to a white brick building built into the side of the mountain. This is what we've been looking for, and it's the evidence we need to convince the Brotherhood of Steel that the threat is real. Before heading inside, we can return to Lost Hills and head to the fourth floor to tell Maxon what we know. <sighs> Hello again, Initiate. Uh, things going well? I have some information on the area north of here. What do you got? I saw their base. It's crawling with mutants. Finally. Well, this'll get the elders off their butts. We'll fortify the fortress and surprise those damn mutants. You can't play defense on this one, Maxon. So, uh, what is your alternative? Well, it's obvious something needs to be done. It would be best if we attack the mutants before they attack us. We are going to need the elders on our side for this one. Mm, not a bad plan. Tell you what, let me go try and beat it into the elders. No guarantees, but I'll try. With that, Maxon tells us that the elders have called a meeting in the conference room. During the meeting, they ask us to relay what we've seen, and we can tell them that we found a military installation being used by mutants. They ask what the mutants look like, and we can describe them as looking exactly like the one that Vree performed an autopsy on. When they ask us if we think these creatures are the same, we say yes, they're nearly identical, and then they ask us what sort of threat the mutants pose. We only have one response. We tell them that just as the Brotherhood of Steel has been preparing for war, this mutant army has been preparing for something big. The elders initially present resistance. They claim that we haven't provided any proof that the mutants are a threat to them, but we can point out the fact that every mutant we've come across is heavily armed. They are not arming themselves just to parade around, they intend to use those weapons. It's possible that they're already on their way here, as the Brotherhood is the only real opposition that they have. And so we can suggest a preemptive strike. We don't know when they're going to attack, but they don't know that we're coming either. The sooner we attack them, the better. After making this convincing argument, the Elders agree to send four paladins to help us infiltrate the military base. That's it. All the men and women living in this bunker, and all their high-powered energy weapons, and they send four paladins? What a waste of time. Maxon has nothing further to say, so leaving Lost Hills, we can head back to the Mariposa military base. This time when we arrive, however, four paladins walk in from the west. The game describes them as crack assault paladins, and they have a variety of things to say, including, I'm here to kick ass and chew bubblegum, but I'm all out of bubblegum. 
which I believe is a reference to the 1988 science fiction horror film, They Live, directed by the famous John Carpenter. Tragically, these paladins don't actually enter the military base with us. They help us out here at the entrance, but once we go inside, here they stay. Some help. Now we could always start by attacking. And the paladins are helpful. They carry Gatling lasers and rocket launchers. And we make quick work of the mutants here. On one of the mutants, we find a hollow tape. Once we read it, we learn that although the tape is damaged beyond use, there is something written scratched on the plastic. Code 010597. This appears to be a date, January 5th, 1997, but I fail to understand its significance. Fallout 1 was released in 1997, but much later in the year, not on January 5th. At any rate, the front door is locked, but this code opens it up. However, as soon as we enter... We find the mutants waiting for us, and they get a preemptive strike, killing Katya. Yes, I, I realized that I pronounced her name Kajita in yesterday's video. My bad. Not sure why I misread that, but I did. It's Katya. Anyway, if at any time we attack the super mutants here at the base and that attack lasts more than two rounds, the entire Mariposa military base goes on high alert, and our job becomes much more difficult. There are, however, a few ways to do this more stealthily. If we brought with us a robe of the Children of the Cathedral, we can wear it as a disguise. The guard at the gate stops us and says, Halt! This restricted area, you no know, be here. If we say, die, spawn from hell, we defeat the purpose of wearing the disguise, they immediately attack. If we say, I've come to talk with your master, we get teleported directly to the boss, which can be useful, but we want to explore the whole base, so instead we can choose either of the bottom two options. We can say, I'm with the cathedral, let me by, or I'm a special mutant, on a mission for your master, let me pass, or face the consequences. He says, if you lie, me kill you. However, once we reach the door, we still need the passcode. To get it, we could try stealing from the mutant, but this could lead us into trouble unless our steal skill is high. There is, however, another way. We recall that the super mutant in the Death Claw Cave was holding a radio. At the time, all we heard was static, but now that we know that the mutants were coming from this base, we can pull it out to try again. There is a squeal of static, then we hear a deep voice over the radio. Command to patrol, command to patrol, what is your status over? For this to work, we need to choose either of the bottom two options. We can say, Command, we are under attack by a large group of armed humans. Request assistance, over. Or, Help! Unknown attackers! Heavy damage! Coordinates follows. Ten. Arrgh! Either way, on the other side, we hear, Roger, patrol. We are sending help now. Hold on. And with that, most of the mutants guarding the door walk out the front gate and leave. This allows us to walk on through. However, the main guard is still there. But since we don't have our weapons equipped, he's not initially hostile. We find the same two speech checks that we discovered earlier, but since we are not wearing the cathedral robes, we don't find an option to masquerade as a child of the cathedral. However, passing a speech check to say that we're a special mutant on a mission for the master causes the mutant to allow us to pass through. And instead of picking the lock, if we have Katya in our party, we find an option to ask her if she can pick this lock. She says, no problem. And in two clicks, we're in. And this time, we are not greeted by a super mutant surprise party. Now, to find the master. You'll notice these big red lights lining the walls. These signify whether or not we've tripped the alarm. Tripping the alarm has many consequences, including turning on the robot defenses and making all super mutants hostile. But until we trip that alarm, many of these mutants are not initially hostile, and we can rely on our speech skill or a cathedral robe to get us through safely. We'll start by turning right. Here we again get accosted by a mutant. We have to bluff our way out by saying that we are a special mutant. And if successful, we find a computer bank. 
Most of these are called Mark IV computers. We can't interact with any of the Mark IV computers. They are just decorations. However, the final computer is labeled simply computer. This one we can interact with. If we choose to use the radio on the computer, we link the radio into the force field control computer. The next time we activate the radio, yellow force fields turn on. Now that we have the radio, we can toggle these on and off. This will come in handy if we trip the security alarm. If we do, all of the yellow barriers turn on, and these barriers block our path. We can't walk through them. But with the radio, we can simply flip them off. We can also use them to control super mutant movement. Right now, we haven't triggered any alarms, but assuming we had, we could lure mutants into hallways lined with these yellow force fields. We could then use the radio to turn them on, effectively locking the super mutants inside a room. We can pass through the red force fields, but we take damage if we do. The yellow force fields, however, don't cause damage, but we can't pass through them. So being able to control the yellow ones is really useful. If we use our science skill on the force field control terminal, we learn that as we activate the field control computer, we can hear a low-pitched hum throughout the complex. If we try again, we learn that we play a game of 21, but we're not good enough to break it. If we try a third time, we learn that we think all of the folders on this computer are protected, but we haven't completed our search. A fourth time, we learned that the only folder not protected is the Recreational Games folder. We're playing poker with one of these computers. Our success depends on our luck skill. If we are eventually lucky and we win, we'll learn that we break the bank in a game of 21 and sneak into the main system through the endgame screen. We gain 800 experience points for our unusual hacking procedures. Blackjack. I don't really understand the lore behind what we just did, but it is a way to gain 800 experience. To continue, we can move southwest. We see a group of mutants in a big room, but we can safely skip by these guys for now by instead traveling into the room just beyond. Here we find another computer. We press some buttons, but the computer seems to be damaged. It'll take some work to operate it. If we try to use our repair skill, we learn that the computer is not physically damaged, but instead appears to have some corrupted data. So in order to activate it, we have to use our science skill. This computer is running some sort of artificial intelligence. Like with Zax, we can talk with it to get the information we need. We learned that this terminal is part of a WLAN matrix network used to optimize remote unit operations. It controls the operation of all General Atomics International Industrial Robots in this factory, including the Robobrains and Mr. Handy Robots. We have a number of options here. If we choose the Terminate Pest Control option, we get a system error. Delete rights not available. So instead, we can choose to modify Pest Control, and it gives us five options. All pests, no pests, small living pests, large living pests, and unauthorized pests. Presumably, this is supposed to reprogram the robots to attack either the super mutants as large pests or other creatures, but this terminal is confusing and from what I've read online appears to be bugged. The only result we get is if we choose for pest control to target large living pests. Once we back out of the terminal, if we move to the right, we see that three of the mutants are dead. But there are no robots over there, so we don't really know how they died. But we don't find an option to remotely kill all of the mutants beneath us. We find an option to play a game of hearts. I think this is a luck roll. I won one, but got no reward. And we can ask it some information. We can ask, do you know what this location is? But this information is classified, so to get an answer, we have to choose Override Continue Request. We learned that this is the FEV Production Control Facility. This terminal has been online since 2074. Final pre-production process was in 2075, and the base, according to this computer, is currently under final construction and is due to open in 2078. It appears to not realize what date it is. When we ask it what FEV is, it says FEV is Forced Evolutionary Virus, a product of the Livermore slash Sound Laboratories. It is designed to increase the genetic complexity of a DNA slash RNA series in a shorter period of time. A much briefer overview than what we got at the GLOW, we find an option to change the movement speed of all robots controlled by this terminal. Setting to minimum movement may come in handy in case we trip any alarms. 
We find an option to adjust sensor parameters as well. I'm not sure exactly what this does, but I think it may have something to do with floor traps. Perhaps turning on minimal sensors makes it harder to trigger floor traps. Either that or the number of rounds it takes during battle to trip the base alarms. If we choose to initiate emergency shutdown, all we do is lose access to this computer. If we try to use our science skill to activate it again, it says there is no response. And with that, we exhaust all of the terminal's options. Moving south, we can open the door to the room with the super mutants inside. They have all the same dialogue as the ones we've already talked to, so passing a speech check, we can bluff our way out. On the ground in this room, however, we find a copy of Guns and Bullets. Moving northwest, we see an elevator next to a bunch of robo-brains. If the alarm has been triggered, these robo-brains wander all over the place, and they attack us. But if not, they sit here quietly. Another reason not to trigger the alarm. Now, I read online that we could use dynamite or plastic explosives to destroy the force field generators next to these red force fields. But after trying many times with dynamite and plastic explosives, I was unable to destroy the force fields. We also can't use science or repair to disable them. So instead, I found that the only way to get past them is to simply walk through them. They only do between two to four points of damage if you're in power armor. The problem with this, however, is that since our companions are unarmored, they get hit for between six and 20 damage. Taking the elevator to the second floor, we find another red force field blocking our way. We pass through it unscathed, but catch ya! So yeah, this was a nightmare. Companions completely disregard these force fields. Even if I go out of my way to avoid them, they'll still just sort of wander through them, especially dog meat. Additionally, the space just outside an elevator that's blocked by a red force field is so small that if you have a lot of companions, it's easy to get stuck. The companions take up all of the available hexes, and so you just have to sit there and wait for one of them to wander through the force field so that the rest of you can get on out of it. It was horrible. I had to reload many previous saves just to navigate through without companions dying. And I had to constantly heal them with stim packs. What a nightmare. Incidentally, we learn in Fallout 2 that in the canonical ending to Fallout 1, Dogmeat dies here after running into one of these red force fields. In general, it was just far more inconvenient to have companions here than to explore it by myself. We can tell our companions to wait, but we can't tell Dogmeat to wait. And here, the radio that controls the yellow force field comes in handy. On the first floor, we could trap Dogmeat between two yellow force fields, thus preventing his death later. At any rate, on the second floor, following the hallway to the southeast, we arrive in the super mutant barracks, and they pay no attention to us, even when we loot their containers. There is so much loot here that I can't possibly comment on it all. The greatest rewards are in the locker room where we find one locker with a rocket launcher and rockets, another with a flamer and flamer fuel, and a final one with seven different thrown explosives. Going through the barracks, we can bypass a red force field and continue by traveling to the west. Here we find a stupid mutant described by the game as a mutant with a phenomenally small cranium. He says, You know go in room. If we try to go in the room, he attacks, but he's so far away from his super mutant companions that we can kill him without arousing their suspicions, especially if we kill him in fewer than two rounds, thereby not triggering the alarm, which should be pretty easy to do. He is guarding a locker room where we find a bunch of chems, buff out Psycho, Radex, and Super Stim Packs. Not to mention some regular Stim Packs, first aid kits, Radex, booze, and a doctor's bag. But that's it for the second floor, so to continue, we have to retrace our steps, go through the red force field again, and take the elevator to the third floor. On the third floor, we have to pass through a red barrier again, but this time we find a wandering super mutant. His name is Flip. Unlike the others, he stops us and says, A human. This is very interesting. You will come with me to the lieutenant, or you will perish right here. If we say okay, we skip to the very bottom of the complex, but if we say no, he turns hostile. But thankfully, he's far enough away from the others that they don't turn hostile. The only way past him peacefully is if we're wearing a Children of the Cathedral robe. But if we do choose to kill him on his corpse, we find a unique item, a flower. These have no real purpose, and we can get more of them at the cathedral. It's just a collector's item. 
Once he's dead, we can move south to enter this southern room. The mutants here challenge us, but we can pass a speech check to get by. But it's not really worth our time. All we find in here is one empty locker. Heading west, we pass through a really big open area. The floor here is lined with traps, so we need to be careful. Most of the traps I found were against the western wall, so if we scoot through the middle of the floor, we can usually avoid most of them. We find a path to the south and a path to the east. Heading east for now, we find an elevator, but this elevator is broken. You see a sign on the door stating that it's out of order. Even if we try to repair it, we learn that we can't repair it. So turning around and this time heading down the southern hallway, we pass by a mutant, but he immediately starts to attack. The only way to pass by this guy without violence is if we're wearing a Children of the Cathedral robe. But if we are, he says you should not be here. This area is off limits to the children. We can ask him, why? What is this place? And he says, this is the prisoner cell block. Here we hold humans until you dip them. Good stuff, huh? The only way past peacefully is to say, okay, thanks. Then he ignores us. But if we say, what is the dipping? He says, you're too stupid to be a child of the cathedral. You must be an intruder. And he attacks. Once he's dead, we see the cell blocks to the south that he was talking about. And in the middle one, we find a woman. But when we talk to her, she says, oh my God, you killed him. We can say, I'm sorry. I didn't know that he was so close to you. And she says, he was my lover. He was my best friend. I can't believe that you did that to him. And we can say, again, I apologize. How could I tell that he meant so much to you? Look at him, he's a mutant. And she says, he was a human being. The only way he could survive was by being dipped. You killed him. We can apologize yet again. And she says, you didn't have to kill him. And she starts to sob, leave me alone. Poor Sarah. She was so in love with him that if we attack him and she sees us, she'll join in the fight, shouting, enemies of the master must burn in holy flame, and the blood of the children shall be avenged. So it looks like she and her lover were kidnapped by the mutants, but before they could escape, he was turned into a mutant. But even though he was now a servant of the master, he still came back here to look after Sarah. In the bottom cell, we find a skeleton wearing a vault jumpsuit. And could it be that that vault suit says 13? Could this be yet another one of our fellow vault dwellers? If so, I wonder why we find him dead here. I wonder why the master didn't just turn him into a super mutant. Moving east, we find another elevator, but this one works. We can take it to the fourth floor. As soon as we arrive, Katya says, I'm really starting to hate this place. On the fourth floor, we see mutants and a Mr. Handy to the south, children of the cathedral to the northwest, a mutant and a child of the cathedral to the northeast, and robo-brains to the north. But for getting this far without tripping the alarm, we earn an additional 2,000 experience. But we still have a ways to go before we can celebrate. If we move south to explore these mutants, they shout, HUMAN, and immediately attack. This is VAT Team 9, an elite squad of super mutants, and they are hostile on sight. So it's best we try this again to get in our attack first. When the mutants are destroyed, we can turn our attention to this Mr. Handy. If we choose our science skill, we learn that we can't access the robot's functions as it is disabled. So, trying our repair skill, we tinker with the malfunctioning components, but we need more time to make the fix. This just means we have to try again. So using our repair skill until we're successful, we learn at last that the robot has been repaired, but it's still not functioning. So once repaired, we can then use our science skill to reboot the onboard computer. And in doing so, we successfully restart the robot. But we notice that the robot's radio is broken. Unit 462 online. Self-test, adjusting unit location data, fixed. Rebuilding memory file, fixed. Error, task incomplete. What is your incomplete task, we can say? Unit 462 is a cleaning model. Must finish cleaning and maintenance of this level. What do you have left to clean, we can ask, and he says, the VAT control room, end of list. When ready, we can chuckle and say, go ahead and finish your task. Mr. Handy says, okie dokie, restarting task. And with that, he travels north up the hallway and detonates by one of the force field generators. 
Strangely enough, this force field wasn't functional to begin with. It doesn't turn on if we activate base security. We can't toggle it on and off with our radio, which in fact doesn't even work on this level. But it's still worth our time to hack into the Mr. Handy, because doing so, we earn a thousand experience. Heading up the hallway, we can go northwest or northeast. We'll try going northwest for now. This, as the robot told us, leads to the VAT's control room. And inside, we find a bunch of children of the cathedral. But they plead with us, please don't kill me. I only work here. I surrender. You wouldn't kill an unarmed man, would you? Would you? Since they're not hostile, we can ignore them for now. We see a number of computers here. If we try tinkering with them, we manipulate the computer and a moment later it sparks once and then shuts down. You hear over the loudspeaker, warning, intruder alert. Oh great, and after all of that, we went ahead and triggered base security. Well, reloading a previous save, we can ignore the VAT's control room for now and instead head east. I don't want to trigger anything that can set off the alarms until I've finished exploring the base. Walking through the red force field and suffering through the damage, we find another elevator here, but this one is out of order. It must connect to the other one out of order on the third floor. So turning around and heading north, we see that the robo brains here are not hostile because we haven't triggered base security yet. So the only way forward is to head southeast. We see two people here, and if we creep forward slowly, we can overhear a conversation. Your report, Van Hagen, says the mutant. The master is pleased with your progress, but his need is great, and time is limited, says Van Hagen. The master should know that raw material is limited. We cannot create our soldiers without more stock. He is aware of your problems. He's working on it as we speak. Tell me of his plans. We will need to coordinate activities if the unity is to succeed. The Master has become aware of an undiscovered and living vault. With that much raw material, we can create a great force. According to the prediction software, it'll be exactly the numbers we need to succeed. Excellent. This is most fortuitous. Are the inhabitants contaminated? Oh, this is the best part. If their representative is any example, they are clean. Pure strain. Oh, this is most exciting. What vault is it that we plunder? Vault 13. And we shall have them soon. Very soon. And with that, we gain a thousand experience points by learning that the master is trying to find vaults where he knows he can find hundreds of primes. Primes that have a greater chance of mutating into the rarest, most powerful types of supermutants. Supermutants that are intelligent. Supermutants that are immune to the diseases of the wasteland. I think this is even more evidence that the skeleton we found in that cell was indeed the remains of a Vault 13 Vault Dweller. They haven't met us yet, and yet Van Hagen talked about a representative from Vault 13. That could have been Talius, whom we met in the Boneyard, or whomever lies dead in the cell. Perhaps they were trying to get the location of Vault 13 from that person, but that person resisted, which is why he's dead. As soon as we step closer... Well, I'm quite impressed. My spies told me you were resourceful, but they seem to have underestimated your talents. Guards, capture him! This is the Lieutenant of the Master's Army. If we manage to fight or sneak our way here, we find no options to talk with him. Instead, he and his guards attack. But the Lieutenant here is none other than the very same Lou whom Harry tried to take us to all the way back at the Necropolis. And if at that time we chose to travel to speak with Lou, we could have had the following conversation with him. Oh, this is excellent. You know, I actually doubted my officers when they said they'd captured a prime normal. It is so nice to see you. What do you want with me? Why, when you become one of us, of course. I can't have a perfectly good prime normal and not make it one of the chosen ones, now can I? After you tell me where your vault is. The option we have doesn't really match the response that we got, but we can continue by saying, All right, I'll tell you where my vault is on one condition. Conditions? How delightful. Go ahead, amuse me with your condition. 
All of the other options we find here just send us down into other dialogue trees that end in torture or failure. We'll explore those outcomes in a minute, but for now we need to better understand the story by saying, I want to be able to ask you some questions first. Why certainly, my dear human. I'm curious just to see what you'll ask. What is it you do here? My dear human, this is the great procreator. Here we'll make others of the master race and ensure the unity. It's all quite glorious, I assure you. Oh, sounds like it. But uh, why do you need all of this to procreate? Presently, there is a slight problem in the reproductive process. It's being attended to. For now, we must use the vats to turn humans into super mutants. You'll experience that glory yourself momentarily. Tell me about the unity. The unity is our goal. It is quite simple, really. Certainly, even you have noticed the steady downhill slide of civilization. Well, yeah, but... The super mutant is the next advancement in human evolution. To save the world, we will convert all the worthy individuals. Simple, efficient, glorious. But there's no choice involved. Did you make the choice to be born into this ash-covered world? We, the super mutants, are the best prepared for the world to come. What is free choice compared to life? How are super mutants more advanced than humans? Intuitively obvious to the most casual observer. We are highly intelligent and immune to disease. The strong survive. It is our goal to improve the human race. Pretty lofty goal you got there. So how are super mutants made? Ah, the wonders of technology. Before the war, the human scientists made a drug called FEV. It was designed to make the perfect human. So you're the perfect human? Better. More than human. I too was once human. Like you, I was a slug wallowing in the mud before being exposed to FEV and undergoing my glorious transformation. We learned from the holotapes that we recovered from the glow that the FEV can infect humans in one of two ways. Either humans are injected with it, or they absorb it through their skin. It sounds like the master is making his army by dipping people in vats filled with FEV. So, you're planning on dipping everyone in this FEV? Exactly. Now you see. Uh, sure I do. Hey, can I ask you a few more questions before you dip me? Certainly. We have all the time in the world. Trust me. Who do you work for? We all work for the Master. To uphold the glory of the Unity. He was the first, you see. The first? Does that mean he's a super mutant too? Well, Lieutenant, how did you come to work for him? Fate. Luck of the draw. I was the strongest of my batch to be dipped in the virus, and I have always supported the ideals of the Unity and the Master. For he is right. And for my devotion, I have been rewarded. So what's the Master like? He was our guide to the life-giving virus, and he is father to us all. And he so wants to meet you. I hope you are honored. Uh-huh. Well, where is he now? He's busy with the children of the cathedral. They actually consider us gods. But then, who can blame them? Oh, so he's not here. He's with the children of the cathedral. But we were just there. Well, close to there, we were at the Angel's Boneyard, which is just north of the cathedral. Well, at least while we're here, we can get rid of the Master's mutant factory. So, you honestly think that you're gods? Of course not. We are simply the future. Can you tell me how the FEV works? Oh, I suspect that's far above your ability to comprehend. But not to worry. 
Soon your eyes will be open to a whole new life. Well, what do you want me for? <sighs> Haven't you figured it out yet? You're a prime normal. Soon you'll be one of us. Why am I a prime human? The FEV was mutated by the war radiation. Those living in this desolate wasteland have been exposed to this mutant FEV, essentially inoculating them from the full effects. Oh, so when the bombs hit the glow, blowing a hole in the roof of the West Tech Research Facility, it released earlier forms of FEV into the atmosphere, which combined with radiation from the war and then rained down on the people of the wasteland, effectively working as a type of vaccine, making them immune to the benefits of FEV, but still susceptible to some of its side effects. So you need those who are uncontaminated, those who never sat through an FEV rain. People who say, lived for generations, safe underground in a vault, to make a superior breed of super mutant. Right? Oh my, you are brighter than I thought. Now you know why we need your vault. Too bad you won't get it, Lieutenant. Oh, how disappointing. I'd so hoped you would see the light before. Well, when you're one of us, I'm certain you'll understand. Then you'll embrace the unity. Oh, all right. Well, I think I'll be going now. Going? I believe. Let me check. Why, yes. I almost laughed. How wonderfully humorous. The only place you're going is the vat. But first, you'll tell me where your vault is. I hope you can take rejection. We shall see, won't we? With that, the lieutenant steps forward and knocks us to the ground. Feel better now? Since torture is such a crass, yet oddly satisfying and effective technique, I'll ask you once more, nicely. Where is the vault? I'm not telling. I rather hoped you'd say that. How was that? In a more chatty mood? Now where were we? Oh, of course. The vault. It's, it's in your dreams. Ah, I feel much better. And you? Now be a good little human and tell me where your vault is. This is getting most tedious. Go to hell. I do so admire your will. Guards, take him to his cell and prepare him for the dipping. He'll tell us where his vault is when he's one of us. If you're so sure I'll tell you after dipping, then why bother with all of this torture? Well, you see, there is this minor drawback. Sometimes, not always, a person's memory is, um, how shall we say, interrupted by dipping. So there is a small chance you'll forget the location. So wait a minute, you can't afford to dip me. Unfortunately, at this point, I have to take the chance. I do need that information. You'd better hope I forget, because if I remember any of this, you're mine. And with that, we appear in the same cell where we found that Vault Dweller's skeleton. It's the cell right next to Sarah, and if her lover is still alive, he is patrolling the hallway outside. We can pick the lock, but as soon as we step outside, even if we're sneaking, he stops us. And then he'll either take us to Lou, or we have to fight him to get by. This is one way to get to the Mariposa military base earlier in the game. The only problem is they take all of our equipment, including all of our weapons. So to kill this guy, we have to be pretty decent with unarmed damage, and then we have to sneak through the place to arm ourselves from all of the containers before we can finally return to the fourth floor to confront the lieutenant. Alternatively, we can give in. You win, Lou. My vault is across the mountains to the west. Here, I'll draw you a map. Excellent. 
I believe you understand. So you're sure you want to tell where the vault is? Torture can be so enjoyable. Yes, I'm sure. that the Vault Dweller is turned into a super mutant and becomes just another anonymous soldier in the Master's army. But if we give the Lieutenant the location of Vault 13, the Master and his army arrive and tear off the door. They immediately begin their assault on all of its residents. Vault is woefully unprepared. Jakorian, the overseer, is the only one who can present a threat, and that's because two miniguns are built into his overseer's desk. But even they are not enough to withstand the master. But assuming we didn't get dipped and we didn't give away the location of our vault all the way back at the necropolis, here, many months later, we arrive fully armed and with our friends. And together, we can attack the Lieutenant and Van Hagen. But we realize that we've been tricked. There are two more super mutants hiding here, one behind a shower wall and the other in the corner. One wields a rocket launcher and the other a minigun. This is one of those battles that is pretty much impossible to survive with all of your companions. The only way I was able to do it was to tell Katya, Tycho, and Ian to wait in the western part of this floor. But since I couldn't tell Dogmeat to wait, he and I attacked the lieutenant. If we lure him away from his guards, we have a much better chance of surviving. Once he's dead, we can move in, take out Van Hagen in a single shot since he's poorly armored, and then deal with the remaining guards. Now the thing is here, the lieutenant has one of the most breathtaking death animations in the entire game, but killing him this way, he's hiding behind a wall, which means we don't get to enjoy it. So I went through the fight again, this time being careful that he's in a position where all can see, and killed him. <laughs> Oh, brutal! On his body, we find a holotape. This is an encrypted decoder disk. We can download the information to our Pip-Boy, which we can use to access the VAT's control computer. We can then loot the dead, and we walk away with some great gear. A Gatling laser, a rocket launcher, plenty of ammunition, a laser pistol, and yet another Children of the Cathedral robe if we don't have one already. Strangely enough, even though that battle took many rounds, we didn't activate base security. I wonder if the lieutenant's battle is an exception. At any rate, we can retrieve our companions and head back to the VAT's control room. But with the lieutenant dead, when we click on the children of the cathedral, <laughs> they scream, you killed the right hand of God. The master will be most upset. Now it has come time for us to join the holy flame and they self-destruct. <laughs> what on earth? Looking through the window to the northwest, we see quite a view of the vats. Goodness, pre-war America spared no expense with this research project. Using our science skill, we can access the main computer on the right side of the window. This is the vats control computer. Here we see a number of options. We'll start by reading the search logs. 
Here we can download some pre-war information to our Pip-Boy, but not all of them work. But we find one here about Captain Maxon, and this one is still intact. We can download it. Trying again, we see that the one on Boyarsky has an unexpected end line, bad data encountered. However, when we select the one on Gray, we can download it. But sadly, the one on Anderson is corrupted. So we only get two from this terminal. Opening up our Pip-Boy, we'll start by reading Richard Gray's audio diary. Oh, wait a minute. Richard Gray? We remember that name. We first heard about Richard Gray when talking with Harold. God, Richard. Richard Gray led a small group of us up there. Richard Gray was a doctor. A little older than me, and Fran was he smart. He found the source. Some sort of old military base. We lost a lot of folks getting in there. Harold and Richard Gray were trying to find the source of the mutants plaguing the wasteland. And so they traveled here to the Mariposa military base. After most of their party died to the base's defenses, Richard Gray was knocked into one of the vats by a robot crane, and Harold was splashed with some FEV. But Harold didn't know what happened after that. Hopefully here we can learn the rest of the story. I'm dying. I need to get this down before the pain overwhelms me. I can't believe that I was finally able to drag myself out of that vat. The slime did not affect me, but I nearly drowned. I don't know what happened to Harold. He was standing right next to me when the crane knocked me into the vault. He must have been killed, or he would have tried to help me. Francine is dead, killed by one of those robots. Well, we know that Harold was not killed, and to his great shame, he didn't help Richard. He fled. We could tell on the tone of his voice that he felt bad about that. To this day, I don't know. He never made it back here, and, well, I couldn't face the wasteland again, so I, I never looked. I have no idea how much time has passed. I was able to hack this computer to turn off the robots and record this, but now my mind is slipping away. There is much pain. The green slime that I was immersed in is the source of all of the mutations that we traced here. My skin is beginning to fester and peel. In other areas, it's bubbling and starting to expel a green mucus-like substance. Some days, the pain is almost tolerable. I can finally walk a few steps again. It seems inconceivable that I dragged myself all the way up here from that vat room. Strangely, I'm actually feeling stronger, though I'm still in a lot of pain. Everything seems to be getting smaller. I think I consumed one of the mutant things scurrying around here today. Before I knew what was happening, some sort of tendril sprang from my stomach and covered the poor creature. As soon as it had sucked the rodent into my gut, I could actually feel its mind. I think... There is the very real possibility that I'm going slowly insane and can no longer differentiate between what is real and what is a hallucination. Maybe I'm still slowly dying in the vat and I've imagined all this. Things are becoming more clear to me every day. This toxin has actually improved my mind. I feel like I can comprehend even the most complex philosophical questions simply and directly. It's as if all the layers of artifice have been stripped away. I wonder what would happen if I submerged an animal in the vats for a prolonged period of time. Would it gain awareness? The strangest thing is happening to the animals. They actually become smarter and more aware of their surroundings. I dipped a dog and a rat at the same time today, and they were fused together. It's not quite two creatures anymore, but it's more than one. Perhaps this is the future, a coming together of different creatures in some sort of harmonious unity. I no longer consume the different animals I create simply for sustenance. I have become the instrument through which unity will be achieved. I am so much more than a human being now. It is time to bring others into the glory that is the unity. A lost soul has finally strayed into my home. I was so surprised I consumed him before dipping, a mistake I shall not make again. His mind was so primitive as to be repulsive to my refined cognitive abilities. I've begun to modify myself to be more pleasing to the unity by injecting small doses of the virus into my body. 
The slime in the vats is a man-made virus called the forced evolutionary virus. This information was acquired from my newly grown Neuralink with the base computer. The few wanderers who have found their way here have been a disappointment to me. They can't seem to mutate correctly. The best I've been able to create are some big and dumb mutants. Most can recall nothing before I initiated them into the wondrous unity. I only feed on them for fuel now. Their minds are nothing to me. O oh, glorious creator, I have succeeded in spreading the complete joy of unification to another soul. Unlike the others, his total radiation count was low. I believe this is the factor we have been overlooking all this time, as it seems the conversion is more successful in the cases with less radiation damage. I have never known such glory as I felt when taking his mind into our own. We are beginning to create an army dedicated to unifying the wondrous diversity of life. We have trained them to continue our work here while we search out more populated areas to take them into ourselves. We are beginning to feel the limitations of a body that is mobile. We must find a permanent home with a greater store of knowledge and a steady supply of biomass. We have stopped increasing ourselves until we can find this new unification center. When we have arrived, we will continue to grow and feed until we have brought peace and unity to the entire world. So the master is not Morpheus. The master is not Lou. The master is Richard Gray. Harold was wrong. He didn't die in the vats. He mutated into the master. Harold likely didn't become stupid himself because at one time he was a vault dweller. He therefore did not spend his entire life being inoculated to the FEV. Perhaps this can explain the unique mutation he had after exposure to FEV. And perhaps this can explain why Talius, whom we met in the Boneyard Library, had a mutation that was very similar to Harold's, for after all, he also was a vault dweller, a dweller of Vault 13. Perhaps Richard Gray, too, was a vault dweller. Indeed, we learn later during the events of Fallout 2 that Richard Gray was from Vault 8, which eventually became Vault City, where he worked as a doctor. He left Vault City to wander the wasteland because in 2092, he was exiled for murder. Backing out of this log, we can move on to read Captain Maxon's diary. Oh, wait a minute. If we find Captain Maxon's log here, that must mean that the base where the ancestors of the Brotherhood of Steel came from, the base from which they launched their exodus, was this one, the Mariposa military base. That means the ancestors of the Brotherhood of Steel were living and working in the same base that produced the FEV. No wonder they think technology is dangerous in the wrong hands. October 10th, 2077. I, Roger Maxson, Captain, serial number 072389, have started this long because it doesn't look good for any of us, and I'd like for people to know what really happened here. All hell broke loose when we finally discovered what those scientist bastards were up to. The colonel has locked himself in his office and seems to be having some sort of a breakdown. The men are screaming for blood. They're looking to me for answers, and I'm not sure what to do. Someone has to do something, though, before this place sinks into an anarchistic bloodbath. Maxon said that the colonel has locked himself in the room. This can be none other than Colonel Robert Spindle, Maxon's superior officer, the one who was commanding the troops here at the Mariposa military base, the one whom he took over for after Spindle died. But how did he die? October 12th. 2077. Every time we get a report from higher up, things get worse here. The war is going in a very bad direction, and this place is about to go into full mutiny with all the chaos that entails. I stopped one of the men from executing a scientist today and demanded that we interrogate them to find out what their orders were. And the very next day, I killed a man today. I was interrogating Chief Scientist Anderson, and he was giving me the full details of the inhuman experiments. He said his orders came from the government, but I didn't buy it. He started screaming about how he was just following orders, how he was a military man, and I just shot him. I tell myself it was to keep him from causing a full mutiny among the men, but I'm not so sure. October 15th, 2077. I tried again to speak to the colonel through the door, but he seems to have completely lost touch with reality. I broke down the door with several of the men, just in time to watch him blow his own head off. Right before he pulled the trigger, he said that he was sorry. 
If Spindle was sorry, does that mean that he knew what the scientists were doing here at the military base the whole time? After all, he was the colonel. Did his superiors tell him what the scientists were working on? Perhaps that's why he had a mental breakdown. Perhaps he was suffering from the shame. October 18th, 2077. By killing the egghead, I seem to have confirmed my position as leader of the men. They follow me without question now. The interrogations invariably end up being executions. Shellman held out for the longest, but the end result was the same. Her arguments about her orders were a bit too specific to be completely made up. I'm getting a real bad feeling in my gut about how this is all going to end up. I don't even lie to myself anymore about my reasons for executing the scientists. October 20th, 2077. I finally replied to the outside world over our radio. I don't know why they never sent anyone here to see what was happening when we stopped responding to their transmissions. It doesn't make any sense. Well... They'll come now. I declared ourselves seceded from the Union. They remember Jefferson Davis. What will history say about me? October 22nd, 2077. What the hell is going on? We declare ourselves to be in full desertion from the Army and no longer under the government's command, and what happens? Nothing. Something bad is coming down. And the very next day, on October 23rd, 2077... I can't believe those bastards did it. Damn them all to hell. They finally let the A-bombs fly. We were right in the middle of trying to pry the real story out of Von Felden when we completely lost contact. I have a feeling the research center was hit hard. I don't know why. Just call it a gut feeling. It seems inconceivable that we were not targeted. I'm sure China will make up for that oversight real soon. Luckily, we had moved our families from outside into the facility the day before yesterday. We do not yet know if the fallout has reached this area. Two days later, on October 25th, 2077, a day after he wrote Maxon's log, announcing his exodus and laying out his five operatives, Sergeant Plattner volunteered to go outside today to take specific readings on the atmosphere. It seems the radiation has not spread this far. Since he was wearing his power armor, there was no threat to him from radiation. But if he had been exposed, he would have had to have been exiled. We don't have adequate decontamination facilities here. The very next day, I convinced the men that we should bury the scientists. I don't know why. Perhaps it was to ease my conscience. I finally started to believe their stories when the last one was dying. My god, what have I become? And on October 27th, 2077... We are leaving this godforsaken place today. I'm leading the exodus to the old government bunker at Lost Hills. I'm leaving this log behind to be buried when this place goes in the next exchange. Who knows? Maybe someone will find it someday. We know that the canonical ending of Fallout 1 is that the Vault Dweller downloaded this log and brought it to the Brotherhood of Steel because we find a record of it in the Citadel during the events of Fallout 3. Since the Brotherhood never come here to the Mariposa military base, except for the crack team of assault paladins who didn't bother to come inside with us, the only way they could have a copy of this diary entry is if the Vault Dweller gave it to them. Maxon and the other soldiers were so horrified when they discovered these scientists experimenting on people with FEV that they began interrogating them and executing them for the crime, thinking the whole while that maybe these scientists were rogue, working on their own. Surely the government would have never sanctioned such an atrocity. But it was only after he killed the final scientist that he began to realize the truth. That FEV was indeed a research project sanctioned by the United States government. That thought, I think, more than anything, is the reason why Maxon declared independence and ceded from the Union. The Brotherhood of Steel may be the remnants of America's pre-war military, but they ceased to be part of America's military even before the bombs dropped. When done downloading all of the logs we can find from this terminal, we have a couple of options. We can choose to display the security codes. Here we see a series of jumbled up codes. Now we can pass a science check to attempt to decrypt this data, or if we killed the lieutenant, we can use the holotape that was on his body to display the security code encryption table. 
Either way, we learn exactly what each of these codes means. They all have essentially the same function. They start the self-destruct sequence for the Mariposa military base. The only difference between all of them is whether or not we sound the alarm and how much time we have to leave the facility before it blows. A 30-second self-destruct sequence that sets the base to alert, for example, is the worst possible choice because we have to fly through four floors and avoid all of the robots before the base detonates. So instead, we'll choose the three-minute silent self-destruct sequence. Since we made it all this way without triggering security, we don't have to worry about fighting mutants or robots on our way out. All we have to worry about are these doggone red force fields. Racing out as fast as we can, we find the Brotherhood Paladins exactly where we left them. Well, I hope they enjoyed their nice little break. Once topside, they say, we better get going. Let's move out. And with them in tow, we can run as fast as we can away from the base. Until... If we weren't fast enough, here we die. But if we were fast enough, we arrive at the world map. Heading back to the military base, we see that none of the floors are accessible. All we can do is travel to the entrance, and we find rubble from the mountain blocking it up. But we earn 10,000 experience points for destroying the source of the mutants. Well, that's sure to make Jacorian happy. We can now head back to Vault 13 to check in with Overseer Jacorian to see what he has to say. What news of the mutants? I blew him up. What about the mutant leader? What about this so-called master? Uh, well, as far as I know, he's still alive. He must be stopped. If not, he could rebuild his empire of mutants and would certainly strike back at us. The Vault will not be safe until the master is dead. Well, great. Nothing's enough for this guy. We fix his water purifier, we make sure mutants can't ever be made again, and he still has more work for us to do. All right, Jakarian, don't worry about it. I'll take care of him soon. Well, that's, that's, that's great. That's very good. You sound like you're in control out there. Please, finish this up soon so that you and I can... When you're out there, remember... The people of the vault know you've saved them. All right, will do, Jacorian. Sounding a little weird there. Well, when done with Vault 13, we can head back to the Brotherhood of Steel on Lost Hills. Annoyingly, Maxon doesn't have anything to say. However, going to the Elders, they say, good work with the mutants. We already heard that you destroyed their production facility. Thanks for taking care of that problem for us. We can say no problem. And that's it guess they don't really care too much about the Master. Well, at least we already know where the Master is hiding. We learned from the Lieutenant at the military base that he left to be closer to the Children of the Cathedral. And we learned from Lorraine at the Boneyard that there used to be a vault Tech vault beneath the Cathedral. It's the same vault where the citizens of Aditum came from. Could the Master have moved in to this vault beneath the Cathedral? Well, there's only one way to find out. We need to infiltrate it. Thankfully, we have some help. Nicole from the Boneyard told us to meet with a follower's spy currently working inside the cathedral. And she said she would send some help. We'll meet up with the followers of the apocalypse and find Nicole's spy inside the cathedral in our next episode. I publish many videos each and every week here on my channel, so if you want to make sure you don't miss that episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes and in a wide array of colors. They come on other products as well, smartphone cases, pillows, posters, prints, mugs, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below where you can click here.
If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with the dramatic conclusion as we finally infiltrate the children of the cathedral.